Okay. So today we are going to look at the last of the major compiler transformations that we need to understand. Uh, basically, software pipelining. Okay. And this is one of the things that has the most direct application in the context of the HLS design process. So what I'll be doing is first starting off with an example that can be related to HLS, also explaining it in the context of pure software. And then what we'll do is we'll switch over to the FFT problem that we already looked at and see a series of optimizations over there that will allow us to basically run the entire system at a much lower initiation interval than what we started with. <coughs> so to understand software pipelining, let's look at a simple piece of code like this. For i is equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. In other words, essentially a for loop. And what is being done inside this is something fairly simple. Let's say it is b of i equals some function of a of i. Okay, that function could be as simple as just a of i plus uh, a constant or something like that. Okay, we don't really care what that function is. We are going to assume that the function is fairly simple and can be finished within one clock cycle. Okay, now if I translate this into an actual implementation, apart from the fact that I need to of course take care of the for loop right so in other words i need to do something which basically takes care of incrementing the counter comparing it against the limit and then deciding whether to branch or not all that is required in software but from a hardware point of view the actual computation is only what is going on over here right so if i assume that my for loop is actually going to be implemented by some kind of a state machine then effectively only this needs to get implemented as part of the computation inside the state machine Okay. Now let's look at what this involves. Effectively, there are three steps involved in executing a function like b of i equals f of a of i. The first one is a, essentially, so what I have is that this can be considered as a for loop with, first I need to read, okay, I'm just going to call it, a, just write down read over there. It's implicit that this is essentially getting the value of a of i. Okay, then there is compute, which is going to be the computation of f of a of i, and finally I have write, which is updating b of i. Okay, so these three steps need to be executed. In fact, what I can do is I can go one step further and I can say I have a read of i compute of i and the write of i that need to be performed to indicate that they correspond to the ith iteration of the for loop. Okay. <coughs> now let's further assume that each of these steps takes one clock cycle. Okay. So in other words, that's a reasonable assumption for certain types of memory. Basically, I give the address and in the next clock cycle, the data will be available. Okay. So definitely a read operation will take one full clock cycle to execute. In other words, it can't, it generally speaking cannot be done combinationally. I cannot expect that I give out an address and get back the data within the same clock cycle, but giving out the address and getting back the data by the next clock cycle is reasonable for on chip SRAM. Giving out the data and getting back, uh, giving out the address and getting back data might take several clock cycles if you are trying to read from DRAM. But on-chip SRAM, you might be able to get it back within one clock cycle. Similarly, writing something to an on-chip SRAM can be finished within one clock cycle. Okay. So with all of that in mind, let's look at what the series of operations and the time steps that are involved over here is going to look like. Okay. So if I have T, right, the operation is essentially going to go like this. I will first have read 0, compute 0, write 0, followed by read 1, compute 1, write 1, read 2, compute 2 and so on. Okay, Which means basically that I have the latency and the initiation interval 
are going to be equal to 3 cycles. Okay. But what we can see over here is, in principle at least, these three things are working with different pieces of hardware or can be run independent of each other. Okay. So it brings up the natural concept of what we already understand in terms of pipelining. Right. Can we do some kind of pipelining? Okay. The alternative for this would essentially have been to say, I do read 0 over here, right? And in the next clock cycle, I can do compute 0, okay? But I'll do that on another piece of hardware, during which time the first one is free, therefore I can do a read 1, okay? And in cycle number 2, I can do write 0 during which I can do compute 1 and I can do read 2. Okay, So this becomes a pattern. I can do read 3 over here, compute 2 and write 1. Okay. <coughs> Eventually it will go on up to read n minus 1. During that time I will be doing compute n minus 2 and write n minus 3 which means that I then need to finish the work. In the next clock cycle there is nothing, no reading to be done but I still need to do computation. Compute n minus 1 needs to be done here, write n minus 2 will happen here and write n minus 1 will ha finally happen at this point. Okay, Which means that I can sort of isolate this block over here and say that this is the repetitive pattern. Okay. Right. But, uh, and that goes on all the way up to here. Right. But there are two differences. Essentially what we need to deal with is, one of them is in this corner and the other is in this corner out here. Okay, These are the so called special cases. Right? The term that is used for this is to say this is the prologue. Right? You will sometimes see this with or without the UE at the end, depends on whether it is a European or American spelling. So, and similarly you have the epilogue at this end, okay? Which the meanings of these words are exactly what they are in English. The prologue is something that happens before the main work. The epilogue is something that happens at the end after the main story has completed, right? So, what you can see in other words is, provided that n is sufficiently large, the overhead required for prologue and epilogue are small and the effective initiation interval that I have got over here is how much? 1. Okay. Latency is still 3 because after I give a input, it still takes 3 clock cycles before the write 0 happens. Right? I do a read 0 and only on the third cycle write 0 happens. So the latency has not changed at all. It cannot change fundamentally because of the nature of the uh, what needs to be done. Okay, But the initiation interval has come down from 3 to 1. Basically what you are saying is since the other two, the compute unit and the write unit are working with different pieces of hardware, right? they could potentially be used together. There are some implicit assumptions being made over here. Right? If you look at this, what is happening is this read and this write are happening simultaneously. For that to happen, they must have independent buses. Okay, There should be some way by which I can give a separate address and data to the read uh, A of i and to the B of i. Okay? In hardware, that is relatively easy. I can just actually have physically separate buses. In software, that's a bit 
I mean, it depends. You may or may not be able to do it depending on how your bus structure is. But the point is, if you can do this effectively, you can use this in order to bring down the initiation interval. Now let's look at what this looks like in terms of the software, right? How would I write this in the software? It is more or less like saying <coughs> the for loop that I have, right? What is it doing at any given point in time? It's doing the read operation corresponding to I plus two, not I. The compute operation corresponding to I plus one and the write operation corresponding to i okay which means that of course i should now run from 2 to n minus 2 right and i need to also make sure that read 0 happens outside as well as read 1 and compute 0 Okay. What happens at the tail? I need to still finish compute n minus 1 and I need to do write n minus 2 followed by write n minus 1. Okay. So effectively what happens is this is the prologue this is the epilogue and this is the loop body that can execute in parallel okay which is why you are effectively able to get an initiation interval of one so you can see how even in the software side i could potentially have rewritten my code to look like this okay it becomes useful only in a specific architecture where these three operations read compute write can be done in parallel and it turns out there are a number of systems where that can actually happen so ti dsps for example were specifically designed around this idea okay there was something called the in fact there still is the c6000 series they have a vliw very large instruction word in a single instruction you can tell it to read something do a computation and write something somewhere else Okay. So all three operations, if they can be sort of combined into one instruction, then that allows you to basically parallelize loops of this sort. It turns out loops of this sort are actually very common in signal processing. Why? Because you can think about it. Any filtering is basically this, right? Instead of doing A of I plus something, it would be A of I into some value plus a constant. As long as your entire compute unit, the Mac multiply accumulate can be done as one unit, right? One operation, you can actually pull that off. You can get an initiation interval of one. Okay. There's a slightly more complex example of this that we had looked at yesterday. So let's just go through that also to understand this in a little bit better context. What we looked at yesterday was we have a for loop where I have six operations A of I, B, C, D, E and F. Right. These have latency of three cycles and this has a latency of 12 cycles. Okay. I need to do this some large number of times or maybe even on an infinite basis as, as long as data is coming in, I need to do this computation. Okay. Now what happens in this situation is I actually am dealing with a slightly different scenario than the earlier one. In the earlier case over here, I assumed that read, compute and write could actually happen in parallel and that they could all be executed on different pieces of hardware. Now I'm assuming something slightly different. There is only one processor, but that processor is pipelined. Okay. So what does it mean to say that the processor is pipelined? It basically means that on every cycle, it can initiate a new operation. Okay. So in principle, I, even though A takes a latency of three cycles on the very next cycle after starting A, I could start another operation. 
okay so we already looked at this yesterday and saw that one way of handling it would be, i mean the normal default would have been a0 two blanks b0 two blanks c0 11 blanks d0 e0 and f0 okay you could unroll this to get better behavior which would basically say a0 a1 a2 b0 b1 b2 c0 c1 c2 but i still need to then put in the nine blanks after that then i can do d0 d1 d2 e0 e1 e2 f0 f1 f2 right over here what i have is latency equals initiation interval equals 27 and over here what i have is latency equals 27 but ii on average equals 9 why am i saying on average because i basically have three things being initiated immediately one after the other that looks like the initiation interval is one but i cannot then initiate another a until the entire block has completed okay if i want it to be a periodic schedule so the effective initiation interval becomes one okay now what's the best possible initiation interval for this i have six operations right therefore the best possible ii is six <coughs> okay so let's now look at supposing i have a timeline that i put down over here And I say I want to execute the operations A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F and so on. I want to basically get this kind of a pattern going. Right? This should be my block schedule. Right? The problem with this is my dependencies, right? I cannot have A0 and B0 or AI and BI happening one after the other. This is basically not possible, right? There would be a dependency violation over here. But if I take this, this is fine. Okay. What does that mean? It basically means that as long as I had a i over here and b i over here, I will not have a dependency problem. What that means is this should be i minus one. Okay. Similarly, let's look at what happens over here. This is not permitted, but this would be fine. Okay. Then comes the catch, right? Is this okay? It's not because I need to have 12 cycle latency after C. So in other words, after C has started over here, I cannot do anything until 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 cycles over here until this point. Okay. So the only valid thing that I have over here, in other words, is from C, I need to go all the way till here this would be okay right that would not be a dependency violation right so in other words if i had the kth iteration of d over here 
and the kth iteration of c over here this is fine there is no dependency violation right what about the rest of them the def again have three so as long as i go to the next cycle i will not have a problem okay once I have done that analysis, let me put everything together and say, can I use this in order to actually put down the numbers of what is allowed to execute where? Okay, I'll just rewrite this quickly over here. Okay, and what I'm going to say is, let's say that f i is going to execute over here okay it means that e i must have executed at this point that is fine there's no dependency violation if e i executes here what will be e at this point it will be the i plus one okay if e i plus one has to execute over here this would be d i plus 1 right and this would therefore be d i plus 2 okay now is where you have to be careful for d i plus 2 to execute over here i cannot have the c from the previous iteration but i can have the d from here or rather the c from here this is okay right which means that i can then put down that c i plus 2 executes over here okay if c i plus 2 executes here what this means is this is going to be c i plus 3 this is going to be c i plus 4 okay for c i plus 4 to execute over here b i plus 4 must have executed here and this would have been i plus 3 okay in fact let's just go back and do the thing there Yeah, and what we have is for the dependency on C, if C i plus 4 is to happen over here, yeah, B i plus 4 happens over here, that's fine. And therefore, i plus 5 would happen at this place. Okay, corresponding value of A over here would be i plus 6. This would be i plus 7. And this would be i plus uh, 4. Okay. So how did I start with this? I essentially drew out a long timeline, put down the pattern that I wanted and just checked if I want to make sure that there are no dependency violations, what index value should be used for each of the computations. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Did I necessarily need to choose the ABCDEF pattern? Possibly not. But would I have gained anything by changing that pattern? Again, I don't know. Possibly not. There may be cases where you would. In this case, actually, you would not really gain anything by changing the pattern. Okay. So all that I've done is I've written out a sequence of computations that would happen and then put down the index values that would guarantee that there would be no errors. Okay. With that in mind, let's finally look at one block. Sorry, uh, I made a small mistake over here. As far as the A is concerned, this should be I plus 5 because that's what depends on the next B I plus 5. Therefore, this should be I plus 6 over here and this should be I plus, uh, yeah, I plus 4 is correct for this one. Okay. So now look at the blue box, <coughs> right? This is going to be the loop body, the one that is going to repeatedly execute, which effectively means that now what my for loop looks like is execute a of i plus 6 b of i plus 5 c of i plus 4 now comes the small jump d of i plus 2 then we are back to normal e of i plus 1 and f of i okay 
and what I will have of course over here is there will be a prologue what will the prologue consist of I'll have to do everything up to a of i plus 5 or rather up to a of and after all i is starting from 0 which means that a of 0 a of 1 a of 2 a of 3 a of 4 a of 5 need to be completed outside the loop a of 0 to 5 b of 0 to 4 c of 0 to 3 d of 0 to 1 and e of 0 all of these will need to get done in the prologue okay and the epilogue would be a has completed so in other words i can only run this until the point that a of i plus 6 is at the end of its the loop right but what i will then need to finish would basically be b of n c of n minus 1 to n d of n minus 3 to n e of n minus 4 to n and f of n minus 5 to n all of these would need to get executed okay as long as i've done that effectively what happens over here is this is the loop body which gets an initiation interval of 6 given the circumstances given the hardware that i have that is the best possible initiation interval that i can target right because at any given clock cycle i can only initiate one instruction one function i have six functions to do therefore i need at least six cycles in order to complete one loop body initiation right the penalty that i pay is the prologue and the epilogue right why is it a penalty because those are they are penalty in two way one is they are one time costs i need to actually explicitly write you know do them separately the other is they are extra code they actually end up increasing the size of your code so this is one of those counter examples that i was talking about right the general rule for compilation is less code is better this is an example where less code is not going to be as efficient as writing the extra code including the prologue okay how do you do this in an optimal manner how do you decide what should be the uh, structure you know the index values that you use pretty much the way that i have written out over here but the point is this can be automated right because all that the compiler needs to do is find out what are the true dependencies that are there between the instructions put them all down in a row and then say okay fine as long as this runs on the previous iteration there will be no violation of dependencies and therefore i can get these index values that i need over here okay so this technique is called software pipelining because in one way what is happening is it allows you to apply the concept of pipelining right the basic idea of pipelining is uh, you know very clear from this very first picture that we have over here right uh, Yeah, from this picture, you can sort of relate why we are thinking of it as pipelining. This is the whole idea of pipelining in hardware, right? You are doing multiple operations, you have multiple hardware units, and they can all be kept busy in parallel. Okay, what this technique allows you to do is to apply the same concept to software. Okay, what can of course be done going further from this is to say, let's say that you actually had a code, right, some function where I had multiple sub function calls right and let's say that this was being repeatedly called inside a for loop right there are dependencies over here by doing software pipelining etc etc by changing the index values around and so on what you could do is if you think about it what what would actually be happening over here is the normal execution would be i would take a certain amount of time for a of 0 some other amount of time for b of 0 
some other amount of time for c of 0 then followed by again a1 b1 c1 and so on right this could then if i apply the principles of software pipelining i can change this around and make it a0 b0 c0 right and a1 b1 c1 a2 b2 c2 and so on okay so effectively the initiation interval becomes equal to the max of a b c latencies rather than the sum of the a b c latencies okay this is in fact how you can actually do it in hardware okay so let's put this into practice let's see how this would apply in the context of yeah Yes. Correct. Actually, in this case, it doesn't matter, right? Because if you really look at what I did over here, even if C had a latency of 13, this would have worked. Right? Because what is happening is, all that I care about is the dependency, this magenta line that I've drawn over here, which says that, you know, this D and this C over here are independent or rather that is where the dependency is right all that I care about is it is sufficiently back in the past so that there is no dependency violation in other words C i is done and guaranteed to be completed before D i needs to start so as long as I can push C i back by sufficient number of iteration cycles iterations that there is no violation of this constraint it will work so in other words once I have come up with this schedule, if you look at it, whether the latency of A was 3, 4, 5 or 6 or anything between 0 to 6, this would have worked. Right? So it's not necessary, that, and it is not making use of the fact that there are multiples or anything of the sort. There is no relation between the numbers itself. All that I care about is once I have put it into a block schedule and then I have that block schedule repeating, I need to ensure that the dependency between the ith iteration of any instruction in a given block has to be satisfied sufficient number of iterations before okay all right so practical application right this is the fft code that I used for the demo last time right and what we have is essentially you know hopefully you are already familiar with uh, this I think I uploaded it onto the Moodle also so please take a look we will make sure that it is there for you to look at. The way that the FFT has been written is just following exactly the principle of you know either the decimation on time or decimation on frequency I am not sure which but one of those techniques right the standard five stage five stages of butterflies right five five stages because it is a 32 point FFT for your 1k FFT it would be 10 stages right and the way that we do it is we do the bit reversal in the beginning not at the end it doesn't matter that can be swapped around it will give you the same result you will see that you know the variables have been declared as static over here that is something that's related to the way that Vivado HLS works it interprets static variables as block RAMs which will retain their value from one call of the function or one invocation of this module to the next okay if you declare a simple variable static integer it will essentially create a register if you declare a static array it will create a ram a block memory okay which if it's very small it might still treat it as registers but chances are it will actually make it a block memory so this is what the code looks like i'm not going to look at the test bench and so on you're already familiar with that let's straight away look at what happens if I 
just synthesize this okay so before we synthesize let's look at the right side over here right you see this tab called directives right directives is where i can give instructions to the compiler or give directives i mean the, that's the best word for it actually right i mean it's not really an instruction it's more like a suggestion to the compiler saying do this there is a chance that the compiler will ignore your directive saying that you know this cannot be implemented in a certain way most likely uh, almost certainly you will get a warning if that is the case right but otherwise what is happening is these directives are used to tell the compiler that it can try certain kinds of optimizations for example unrolling pipelining and so on which are normally considered unsafe for a compiler to do okay so all of those optimizations that we talked about see certain things like common sub expression elimination and all the compiler will just do because those are very obvious and simple and you know reasonably straightforward there may be cases where it is not able to catch a common sub expression and gets you know doesn't do it properly you will usually be able to tell by looking at the synthesis results and you can then fix that right so these directives are usually used at a slightly higher level things that a compiler would not normally do okay let's look at examples so before we get into that first thing we do is we just take this baseline code let's synthesize it okay so what happens when i just synthesize this basic hls code hopefully it runs properly yeah so by the way one other thing you will notice that the time taken for synthesis over here was 15 seconds right is a 32.50 right if it's a 1k50 it will be pretty much similar uh, less than a minute for sure okay if your synthesis is taking more than 1 minute right it probably means that there is some problem with the way you have written the code the compiler is getting confused with something that you have written and is trying to do something which will cause problems for you later on okay go back look at your code and fix that problem right because we actually have instances of a design that has like 9 ff no i think 13 fft blocks matrix multiplication cordic everything in it synthesizing in 1 and 1/2 minutes okay less than in around 100 seconds or so right so depending on how you write the code it is entirely possible to get fast synthesis the problem is there are certain kinds of ways of writing the code that can result in terrible performance also so you have to be careful of that okay so now what do we see here again the main thing to look at is 1600 cycles latency and 1600 cycles initiation interval right because essentially if you go look at you know this analysis pane that is put over here it pretty much tells you exactly what is happening there is a bit reversal which takes some number of steps right if you look at this you will notice that according to this everything should be over within 12 steps right but it's taking 1600 so obviously a step over here is doesn't correspond uh, correspond to one clock cycle a step is a so called control step when a particular operation could be initiated or terminated right and if you go deeper into it you will find that each of those steps in turn has an elaborate explanation of how many cycles or how many steps it is going to take how many, uh, yeah, in turn it breaks it up more but the important point from that diagram is that everything is just completely serial over there okay so if you look at it synthesis option 1600 cycles let's look at what happens over here there are two parts to the latency one is it says that the fft module takes 305 clock cycles and there is also a separate bit reversal loop which takes 96 clock cycles this is already interesting because if i really look at it the bit reversal according to the way that i wrote the code the bit reversal is also a function okay but if you go and look at the results over here right at the bottom that i'm showing you over there you will find that there is one there are a few things over here the important point is inlining function bit reverse into f50 an example of function inlining okay why if you look at the code the bit reverse function is simple it's just a for loop okay and what the system has decided is 
this is not software i'm not going to be scheduling instructions but on the other hand if it was a separate function i would have to create a finite state machine give it a start signal wait for a done signal etc instead i can just use those states incorporate those states into my main system state machine and reduce the complexity a little bit okay bit reverse is a simple enough function it inlines it fft is not fft0 is not simple enough for it to do that it treats it as a separate module which is why in the synthesis result we see that that is treated as an instance whereas bit reversal is treated as a loop okay all right so bit reversal is taking 96 clock cycles let's understand that it has a trip count of 32 meaning that the for loop is actually running 32 times we know that because that's how we wrote the code and the latency is 3 cycles what's happening inside bit reversal i need to compute this index i need to read a value from index and i need to write a value into data out exactly what i showed you earlier right there is a compute read and write the order is different it's not read compute write it is compute read write okay can i pipeline it all right let's try it the way that you do it is you basically right click on this insert a directive okay there are two options you can either put it into the directive file what that means is it creates a separate script that captures your directives right and allows you to have separate scripts with uh, separate sets of directives that you can try out on the same hardware okay the alternative is to put it in the source file okay what you need to do is pick the pipeline directive i'm going to put it in the source file just to show you what it looks like but in general you can put it in the directive file as well it doesn't really matter too much so if i put it in the source file what it does is it just add something called a hash pragma okay hash pragma is not a standard c c++ code on the other hand or rather it is something that is standard in c c++ it is a way by which you can pass directives to the compiler in this case the hash pragma is used in order to pass hls directives okay so what you see over here is it says pragma space hls so it tells it in which area or which namespace the directive is that you are trying to give and then the actual pipeline itself which is the directive what happens when you do this i need to save the file and synthesize it again what will happen when i do that is it will then go through the same process right typically what happens during the synthesis is that you will find analyzing the design and then starting code transformations are two places where it might sometimes get stuck for a while right that analyzing the design is a bit interesting basically what is happening is if you have multiple files unfortunately it ends up being slow it actually takes a long time to read through multiple files if you put everything into a single file it sometimes works faster code transformations is a place where sometimes you can get stuck really badly because especially if you have large arrays that are declared somewhere the compiler can get really confused about what to do with them all right let's look at what impact that change had 1630 has now become 1569 good what was the change that it made the bit reversal loop is now a trip count of 32 is pipelined and now has an initiation interval the target was 1 and it achieved 1 so that's good and it has an iteration latency of 3 therefore the total latency of the system is still 33 it's not just 32 why the prolog and epilog so the iteration latency is still 3 cycles you add all of that together it takes 31 cycles in the loop body plus 2 cycles prolog and epilog okay to complete it so it's able to finish the entire thing within 33 cycles as opposed to 96 and that was what resulted in 1500 coming down to uh, 1600 coming down to 1500 and something okay good let's see if we can do the same thing for the fft also right this fft0 also has a loop inside it what happens if i apply uh, directive there right i'll just give it a pipeline directive it doesn't matter whether it's in the source file or not what happens when i synthesize that is yes 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 <coughs> okay 
you will find that the functions inside the FFT block, right? What are they? There are a lot of things happening over here. There is some computation of index. Let's just quickly take a look at it. Then there is some other additions being done over here. The main work is in this product, right? And then a plus and minus of that product followed by an if statement. If you really look at it, all of them could potentially, a lot of these things could potentially either be done in parallel or at the very least could benefit from pipelining. I can do the expression corresponding to cycle i in, uh, or rather, you know, the dependency for i can be done in the previous iteration and so on. What happens to the synthesis result? It has now come down to 300 cycles. What happened, right? Let's look at the instances. The FFT latency has essentially come down to 51. From 305, it came down to 51, okay? If I go inside it, I'll find that that 51 essentially corresponds to the, actually, that's interesting. Let's just take a look at that. Right. What's happening over here is inside the FFT, there are no further instances, but there is a loop which runs 16 times. It has a target initiation interval of one, but it achieved only two. Okay. Why is that? If you look at it, what is happening is there are two writes to data out that are happening over here. There is data out getting updated here as well as over here. Okay. And the way that we have written the code, at least the data in and data out even though they are separate variables at the top level, as far as this function is concerned, it is just treating them as a single array, a memory block. So it's trying to write two values to it. It says that it cannot do them in a single cycle and therefore it is splitting it out over two cycles, right? And you end up with this achieved initiation interval of two and it has a huge iteration latency. What does that mean? An iteration latency of 20 basically means that in order to do all of these steps, which is, you know, compute this, then do the addition, then do the computing the L limit. This product is a complex floating point computation that takes up a large part of the latency. Okay. Then you have also complex floating point additions, which are also not single cycle latency. They take a little bit more than that. Net result, we have 49 cycles latency for the FFT block plus handshaking one cycle to start one cycle to stop so it becomes 51 by the time it reaches the top level 51 into 5 is somewhere around 250 something plus 33 for the bit reversal we end up with 299 okay last optimization look at how the code over here is written right it looks very similar to this, right? There are three functions A, B, C being called over here. Over there, there are five functions, FFT0, FFT0, FFT0. If you look at the way that the code has been written, it has been written in such a way that the input going into the first function writes into another variable, which then goes as input to the next function. So the dependencies have actually been split across five variables, right? I'm not overwriting the same variable again. Right? What happens if I now add a data flow directive to this function? What does data flow mean? That is software pipelining. Okay. So at the function level, data flow is essentially software pipelining that you apply over here. Right? You have to be very careful with this. For data flow to work, you will find that when you try using it on any function of yours, it will. there's a good chance that it will complain saying that it can't do it. Right? Or it will complain that the order of in which you read some variable or you wrote some variable or you did something else is not correct. It can't handle this. It will keep complaining about it. That's because you need to basically understand that as far as data flow blocks are concerned, in addition to the fact that the dependency should only be in one direction going forward, it also makes an assumption that you are only going to take certain values in order and transfer them. What happened? We have come down to 36 clock cycles. Okay, so from 1600 initiation interval, you have come down to 36. Okay, and the latency over here is 169. Right, so you actually see what's happening is that in this case, the FFT latency instead of 51 actually came down to 33. Right. If you look at what happened over there, you will actually you go inside and you will find that now because you have explicitly made it clear even at the top level that the data out signal is going to be something different for each block. 
it is able to parallelize both the data writes and use a dual port RAM in order to achieve the fact that both the data outs can be written during the same clock cycle. Okay, which means that the latency of the FFT block itself comes down to 33, which means that the total latency of the system is 33 into 5, right? Which uh, 33 into 5 plus something, it should be, okay, I'm not sure uh, about this 169. We'll probably have to look at that and find out where that 169 came from. But you can see that the interval at least is just one cycle greater than the max of the others, right? The bit reversal in this case takes 35 cycles and that ends up being the block B over here, the one with the largest latency, okay, and the bottleneck which sets the initiation interval of the overall system. All good, except for one catch, right? This has basically, what about the hardware usage, right? So what I'm going to do is let me just very quickly just get rid of these uh, directives and go back to the original so that we can do a comparison. Right. So you can see that basically I was able to bring down the latency or the initiation interval from 1600 to 33, 36, the total latency from 1600 to 170 or so, right? What's the net result? Let's just do a side by side comparison. What we do is we can do project compare reports. I have already synthesized the other two with the optimizations the all opt is the one with 299 latency without data flow okay and what you can see is over here the clock is met comfortably in all cases the latency 1600 299 169 initiation interval 1600 299 36 okay now what about the utilization estimates with no optimizations it basically takes 10 block rams with everything except data flow, it takes 22. With data flow, it takes 40. You need block RAMs between every stage. Okay. The number of DSP slices, no optimization, everything is being done serially. So effectively, you end up with the fact that, you know, one floating point multiplication takes four DSP slices. You can do the approximate analysis over here. It takes 20 in the case of no optimization. Surprisingly, in all optimization, it has come down to less. Data flow on the other hand has gone up significantly because now you need to actually do things in parallel. Okay. Similarly for the hardware, the flip flops and lookup tables between no opt and DF opt, there's a nearly, well, 5x, 5 to 10x increase can be seen. In this case, 5x basically, right? And that sort of makes sense because what you're saying is instead of one hardware unit, I now have five of them. Okay. All right, so we'll stop here for now. I'll be uplo uploading this entire code also on Moodle. I think I've already done it. Please go take a look at it, right? And on Monday, what we will do is we will meet in the IE lab. What I want is that all of you have your basic code in place, right? And that we can then sort of start looking at how you profile your code to start with. And then from there, start looking at optimizations for the different uh, types of code that you have, okay? There are, what I'm basically planning to do from now onwards is there are a couple of more examples that are there from the PP for FPGAs book. You can of course read through those directly or even the examples are available on GitHub so you can try them out on your own. I'll be working through them in a little bit more detail in some subsequent classes. There are a couple of concepts that I want to also cover later but for the most part the remaining classes are going to be focused on the project. Okay.